finding polyamorous representation can be tricky. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that a little too abrupt of a an intro? Um, I heard that YouTube's going to be getting rid of thumbnails in the future and only playing the first few seconds of videos, so I'm trying to make my intros a little snappier. Tension grabbing. <laughs> Are you grabbed? Anyway, finding polyamorous representation of any caliber period is a never-ending uphill battle. Usually the best that we can hope for is some kind of brief acknowledgement in a mid-season episode of some irreverent sitcom. Or maybe some kind of end of the series last minute twist in a show that should have gotten at least five seasons, Netflix. Polyamorous people, like many other marginalized groups who are not widely or at all represented in the media, tend to come up with their own canon, choosing certain characters and relationships that felt like they could be seen as non-monogamous based on certain context clues or sometimes even just the lack of strong counter evidence. Hell, I am also guilty of this. This is a polyamorous to be. I will not be taking any questions. I'm explaining all of this to you so that you might better understand how the non-monogamous community felt when in 2017, this trailer dropped. You think it's possible to love two people at the same time? Why not? What is normal? It can never happen. The world won't let it. The world can't stop us. Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman is about the real, unconventional life of Professor Marston, the creator of Wonder Woman. It came out three years after the publication of this book, The Secret Life of Wonder Woman, written by Jill Lepore, although the director has stated that the book was not a direct inspiration for creating the movie. Lepore herself wasn't the first, actually, to give evidence that Marston was some kind of flavor of non-monogamous. That honor goes to Les Daniels, who wrote his complete history of Wonder Woman in 2004. Oh, and yes, the official Wonder Woman movie did happen to come out the same year as the biopic, which, as far as I can tell, was just a coincidence, but I'm sure it didn't really hurt either movie any. <laughs> Professor Marston was written and directed by Angela Robinson, an openly gay director whose most noteworthy credits before this included The L Word, How to Get Away with Murder, and Debs. It stars Luke Evans as Professor Marston, an unconventional educator who believes all human interaction can be categorized into four BDSM-esque behaviors, dominance, inducement, submission, and compliance. A person is most happy when they are submissive to a loving authority. Rebecca Hall is his wife, Elizabeth, who assists with his research and whose career is limited due to her being a woman, a fact the movie likes to remind us of a lot. If it is the same work, then why can I not receive a PhD from Harvard? Because I have a vagina. And Bella Heathcote as Olive, the aspiring journalism student who they hire as a research assistant and then later have an affair with. The movie received generally favorable reviews, with a lot of critics praising the performances of the three leaves, particularly Bella and Rebecca. One review that I found in The Atlantic called the movie a lively feminist biopic, going on to say that... It's genuinely daring how Robinson depicts the evolution of their love. From Olive's girlish fascination with William to her deeper infatuation with Elizabeth, this is a film that doesn't fetishize their fluid sexuality and make it a sideshow to be gawked at. Yeah, um, more about that later. As is the norm when it comes to biopics, much of the events in Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman are speculative or just straight up fiction. But they didn't really matter to the polyamory community at large. Many, some of whom were already familiar with the story and some who definitely were not, flocked to see themselves being portrayed on the big screen in a way that actually centered their experiences. And in a way that left no question. This wasn't some fan theory being pieced together by some video essayist with a huge hyperfixation. This was polyamory, stated explicitly so. Do you think it's possible to love two people at the same time? I was one of the ones who did said flocking. I saw the movie with a couple of friends and polyamorous community members in a mostly empty theater here in Portland, Maine. I was a freshly out and exploring polyam newbie, and the timing of the movie felt honestly a bit serendipitous. And everyone was talking about it, so I had to see it, of course. I don't think I'll ever forget that moment when I came out of the theater, surrounded by my polyam friends, hearing their murmurs of approval, some of whom were just so deeply affected by the film. I remember nodding and smiling and agreeing gently, and yet, deep down inside, a little voice was whispering, Why does everybody like this piece of shit so much?
put him down. That's it. Easy, easy. Okay, that's right. Look right here. I'm going to get us through this, okay? Just let me explain. I know that this video is going to rub some non-monogamous feathers the wrong way, but I just ask that you hear me out until the end before you write a comment. Obviously, if you want to write one, I can't stop you. I don't control you, obviously. But while you're doing that, can you at the very least, you also make sure to dislike the video down below, subscribe so you don't miss any of my other bad takes that come out in the coming years, and also to share this video with all of your friends so that they uh, know who to avoid at the next Rachel Lark concert. Thank you. Before we get too far into this video, just as a heads up, we are going to be discussing a number of uncomfortable and potentially triggering subjects such as grooming, power dynamics, abusive relationships, and unconsensual sexual situations. There will also be discussions of kink and BDSM, which will of course need to be heavily edited to make sure I am still not uh, getting demonetized. But all the same, anyone under the age of 18 should probably run along and go watch something a bit more age appropriate. You know, maybe watch some Miranda Sings instead. Oh, uh, hang on. Hey, Hoots, what's up? I was just... A fucking ukulele? You're kidding. If you do like this video and want to support me, you can, of course, go over to patreon.com slash mainlymandy. Patreon supporters get access to some cool extras, which includes bonus videos like blooper reels or behind-the-scenes footage. I need to introduce our special guest. But, you know, the other woman, like, all of what entire future had been just, like, swept away. And mm -hmm. it's, like, shown as kind of sweet and romantic and it's just that i find that very troubling is that it's just like again unremarked upon we're just supposed to accept it and kind of like it because oh they're in love and oh she likes being tied up so you know hey look everybody it's eve rickert you know eve rickert co-author of the book more than two owner of the publishing company thorn tree press which has published many books about polyamory including love is not colorblind and poly secure both of which i still own when eve heard through the grapevine that i was not the biggest fan of this movie she reached out to me because it turns out she also wasn't the biggest fan so we decided to watch the movie together and share our thoughts and because I am a filthy degenerate content maker, I recorded our thoughts and responses and reactions uh, so that I could then monetize it on the internet. Being a YouTuber is weird. By the way, I live in a basement, so my internet is essentially two gerbils running on a wheel together doing their absolute best. So the quality of the recording isn't as good as I would like it to be. I am moving into a new apartment at the end of the month, and I'm going to be able to afford much better internet. We're talking fiber wire, baby. So hopefully if I do something like this in the future, the quality will be a lot better. For now, though, sorry, you're just going to have to deal with it. Oh, and also, uh, spoilers ahead. If it's possible to even spoil this movie. So to start with, let's just like really quickly run through the first half-ish of this movie and just kind of go over everything that happens. Especially for those of you who maybe haven't seen the movie but still want to be able to follow along. Professor Marston starts with images of families collecting comics, including some issues of Wonder Woman, and burning them while a sad boy in a hat watches. Sad Boy is none other than Professor Marston, who then is brought before a review board at the National Comics Publications to answer questions about his work. This, by the way, is the basic framing device the movie employs, jumping back and forth from the story in this interview into the climax. Other than occasionally pointing out similarities between Marston's philosophies and unusual lifestyle, as well as the occasional plot cough. <coughs> Are you all right, Dr. Marston? <coughs> It's not really that interesting, and I'm not going to be talking about it that much as we go through. From there, we jump back several years to Hartford Radcliffe College in 1928, where Professor Marston is a... well, a professor. Duh. He makes little doe eyes at this student and then meets up with his wife, Elizabeth, where she complains about not being taken as seriously for being a woman, and they also gripe about not getting their lie detector to work. Be prepared for this plot point to matter a lot, and then literally not at all in the second half of the movie. There's a scene where the two of them watch Olive, the student who made eyes at Marston earlier, and has also now signed up to be their research assistant, interacting with her fellow students, and it is uncomfortable. Beauty gives her an advantage over the other girls. No, you can't be serious. Her beauty. Her beauty is an albatross. Oh, the blonde girl hates our girl with a passion. I want to study her. She'll break your heart. Leave you eviscerated in a pile of your own expended semen and bile. Elizabeth and Olive meet, 
And it is also really uncomfortable. My husband, I'll kill you. Excuse me? This movie really wants you to know that Elizabeth is a blunt bitch. Did, do you get it? Is it clear yet? So after this, Olive talks to Marston, tells him she's engaged, and reveals how upset she is with the interaction with Elizabeth. Marston confronts Elizabeth about it. Elizabeth apologizes, and Olive tells her how much she admires Elizabeth, having even read some of her writing. You know, you don't need to feed me a line. I'm not. God, what is wrong with you? They all go out to the speakeasy together, a very appropriate thing for professors to be doing with a student they just insulted, and Olive tells them how she's the niece of infamous feminist Margaret Sanger. She herself, though, was raised by nuns. The Marsons convince slash force Olive to let them watch a sorority ritual in secret, which involves Olive spanking a disobedient pledge dressed like a baby. It's really uncomfortable. Marston tries to force Olive into talking about what the experience was like, which she is extremely reluctant to do. During this, what I can only describe as an interrogation, Elizabeth knows the way that Olive is clearly physically reacting, saying they can measure her heartbeat to figure out if she's lying or not. Her systolic blood pressure would rise. Her systolic blood pressure. You could measure that. Oh, you could fucking measure that. It doesn't matter what you say or what you think. Your body will always betray you. Side note, lie detectors are not reliable or based in solid science at all. I, I know I still have a lot of movie to cover, and we haven't really gotten into the discussion portion yet, but like, I just felt like I needed to remind us all of this now, because a lie detector as a, I don't know, MacGuffin plot device, whatever, is a huge focus in the first half of this movie. There's just like really no getting around that. And yes, in my description box, there is a link to a resource document with plenty more sources talking about the very much debunked science of lie detectors. Feel free to check those out when you have a moment. Anyway, there's this little montage of everyone working on the lie detector and making eyes at each other, and then a scene in which they're all hanging out by some planes, and Olive's fiancé joins them. At one point when the boys run off, Olive confides in Elizabeth that she's thinking of applying to Columbia for a journalism degree. Elizabeth encourages her and even offers to write a recommendation for her. Olive also confesses how much she admires the older woman. I see you in everything you do. I think you're magnificent. They test out the lie detector again, which at first doesn't work, but then they discover it does, but only if the lies are meaningful. Professor Marston is not invested in whether or not he lives in Boston or Louisiana. It stands to reason his blood pressure would not go up. So Elizabeth asks her husband if he's in love with Olive, which a lie detector reveals is true despite what he says. Are you in love with Olive Byrne? No. Well, I guess it works after all. Olive chases after Elizabeth, claiming that she loves her, not Marston, and kisses her, but is rejected. Marston uses the lie detector on Elizabeth to prove she misses Olive, despite what she says, and Elizabeth admits she's in love with Olive, too. You think it's possible to love two people at the same time? They reach back out to Olive, asking her to help explore these emotions together, which Olive is not thrilled by. Fuck you. Your aunt would approve. She believed in free love. They decide to be friends for the time being, and we get another scene of the trio and Chad McDude face here, spending time together. This time, the atmosphere is decidedly less relaxed, as the fiancé seems uncomfortable with how interested the couple is with Olive. What is your intention towards Olive? I don't understand your question. I didn't ask you. I know what your intention is. You're rather obvious. Fiancé makes it clear that he doesn't want Olive spending time with him anymore, and they leave. Olive comes to their office in the middle of the night. They connect her to the lie detector machine and begin asking her about her feelings for them. Are you in love with me? No. Are you in love with Elizabeth? No. Olive initially runs off, but then they all catch up together, start kissing, and have a whole little threesome on the stage. Oh, hell no, movie, you leave Nina out of this! After this, we see the three of them walking around all post-nut happy, and Olive is confronted by her fiancé. Well, I guess, ex-fiancé at this point, about her new relationship. He tells her that where their relationship is out, and then Mars and Elizabeth are fired from the college. Olive tells him she's pregnant, and then moves in with him. Money becomes a pretty pressing concern, because it turns out Marston didn't patent the lie detector machine. I read in the paper the killer's making money hand over fist selling the lie detector machine. Perhaps we could do the same. That's an excellent idea, Olive. 
Perhaps Bill should have patented it. Science is for everybody. So Elizabeth gets a job as a secretary, becoming the primary provider. Olive has her baby, and they decide to be a proper family, giving their relationship a chance, but a bit more discreetly this time. If we do this, we can't let it come back on our children. And now that we're about halfway through the runtime of this movie, let's just go ahead and give a little pause so we can discuss a few things. So first of all, let's acknowledge that there are some pretty significant power dynamics at play in this relationship. Not only are Marcin and his wife much older than Elizabeth, they are also her employers and her educators. They can significantly affect her future, putting her in a more compromised position if things don't work out. Also, because of their age and position, they seem to adopt this air of more aware and educated individuals, wiser to the ways of the world than some sheltered waif who grew up in a nunnery. And because of that, it feels like Olive is meant to just disregard her own feelings and just meant to defer to their decisions. We can see this a few times in the movie, like when Marston and Elizabeth take Olive to a speakeasy. Come on. Where? How are you going to learn anything at all about life if you refuse to live it? There is no discussion about whether or not Olive wants to go. It's just assumed by the Marstons that they know how best how to help her to learn more about the world and off they go. Further, the movie itself encourages us, the audience, to think of this as a good thing, that they are ultimately doing Olive a kindness. I don't doubt that like a situation or scenario like this could be very helpful for someone trying to gain more experiences in the world. But the framing of it, as well as combined with other uncomfortable scenes in the movie, put a bad taste in my mouth. Forcing someone to step outside of their comfort zone before they're ready and not on their own terms can be really bad and maybe even deeply traumatizing. But it's okay. Look, she liked it. It's, it's fine. It's all, it's all good. Olive is constantly framed as this little wide-eyed innocent in need of being told what to do because she is just too experienced or timid to do what she would actually like to do. In fact, it's pretty rare to see Olive herself verbally consenting to what the Marstons ask, or rather demand, of her. Half of the time, she just ineffectively protests and they get their way anyway, or she goes along with things while wearing this look on her face. Even I weren't the only ones to notice problems with this relationship. In this post on the blog Conscious Polyamory, the author says, Like many partners in open relationships, Olive was ultimately dispensable. Someone who could be sacrificed to protect the couple's interests at any moment. There's no way that this polyamorous relationship would have worked if Olive had been a less submissive partner who stood up more for her rights. By portraying Olive as happily going along with everything, the movie creates the dangerous impression that everything Bill and Elizabeth did was okay. And this is how a second partner in a polyamorous relationship should behave. And because of their age and experience, the Marstons constantly put Olive in positions that are uncomfortable, unprofessional, and downright creepy, even abusive. Take when Elizabeth tells Olive not to f her husband, all while being extremely condescending about her beauty. Oh, and if you fuck my husband, I'll kill you. Excuse me? Okay. <laughs> I feel sorry for you. No, really, I, I do. It's not your fault. It's uh, your beauty. It's like a, well, it's like a handicap. It's like having three legs or something. So, um, this is called being verbally abusive. You know, just so we're all on the same page. Or the pledge discipline scene in which Olive clearly doesn't want them there but has been forced to let them watch. The scene is uncomfortable for a lot of reasons. Olive's clear reluctance at having them there, none of the other pledges getting to consent to their presence, and then the fact that Marston just starts, um, pleasuring Elizabeth while they watch? I, I just, I don't get how this is a scene in a movie being praised for being a feminist piece of media like I don't know I feel like I'm going crazy over here and what really gets me is that the movie ultimately presents this as being hot thrilling sexy so I have this theory about why so many people maybe in the the poly uh scene um like this movie which is if you see the whole movie as it actually works a lot better <laughs> So, like, if you imagine, like, this is not meant to be a, a, 
you know, you're not, you're not meant to view this as like something that's actually happening, but it's like, you know, the plumber knocking on the door and <laughs> something completely right. unrealistic <laughs> happens. So that's why I wanted you to pause this before this scene, because it's the first scene where I start to really feel this way. I'm like, this is the most unsexy scene. And yet somehow it's played as though it's supposed to be sexy, but it's like totally like non-consensual and everybody's like wooden and like, but if you're like, if you imagine like, oh, the director was just trying to shoot and, and maybe people who like, that's how people are viewing it. It works a lot better. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. You, you saying that kind of makes the movie make more sense. It does feel like it was kind of like soft core p- for polyamorous. It's like, what are polyamorous like? Well, obviously, they like watching people secretly. And, you know, the, and especially like, you know, like Unicorn Hunter. P- I feel like this is supposed to be the most like for them, that demographic of people looking for their third. So it's like, oh, what do we want to do? We want to see our our hot, our hot lady disciplining other people, other hot girls. And it as we leer unseen by all of them without their consent like not only are they um coercing her into the situation which in itself is creepy and not okay but also they've put all these other women in this position too where they are leering at them without their knowledge so they don't have an opportunity to consent to this which and then there's of course again the power dynamic of the fact that they're much older and her bosses like it's just there's so many layers of gross to the scene so i think a big problem with this movie is that the film takes Marston's assertions that thoughts and words don't matter nearly as much as the body's responses to be gospel at least in the first half of the film it doesn't matter what you say or what you think your body will always betray you he is literally pulling the your mouth may say no, but your eyes say yes card. No matter what Olive says, because her body betrays her true feelings, then everything done to her is hunky dory. She's just repressed. She's just in denial, in need of a much older man to tell her what she actually wants. Your aunt would approve. She believed in free love. Feminist icon, Professor Marston, everybody. I guess in fairness, this isn't really a problem specific to Professor Marston and really a more far-reaching issue in media at large. There is a pretty long sword history of consent being rather dubious in TV and movies. Princess Leia and Han Solo, for example, are a great example of this. We are encouraged by the film to see this pursuit of Han to Leia as romantic because her words ultimately are less important than what the language of the film is saying. And it is screaming, make out already. And I also understand that at the time that this actually happened, a professor having an affair with a student wouldn't really have been blinked at. In fact, such relationships were probably far more acceptable than queer or polyamorous ones. But the movie, which was made in 2017, a mere six years ago, doesn't even offer a light bit of criticism about these actions. It just presents them as romantic, sexy, and acceptable. I think it would have been well within the ability of Angela Robinson to present these events in a far more nuanced manner, one that acknowledges the difference of accepted cultural attitudes at the time while also acknowledging that such relationships were still not morally in the right. Accepted doesn't mean okay. This is also a bit related to why I decided to mention the shadiness of the lie detector storyline. The movie uses the lie detector several times to garner confessions from characters unwilling to speak the truth allowed, becoming a kind of shorthand for a love that dares not speak its name. It never considers for even a moment that such devices have been proven many times over now not to be reliable. Yes, I get at the time that Marston, Elizabeth, and Olive would have seen their discovery as legit, but I still don't think that justifies using the lie detector in this way. Although I I guess getting sketchy admissions using a lie detector from disempowered people is actually pretty um, historically accurate. Ooh, ooh, that was a spicy one. Spicy, sassy, Mandy. (laughs) Self five. Actually, this scene disturbed me much less watching it this time than the first, I did the first time. So the first time I saw this movie, I was in a movie theater and I was like, like by the time we got to this scene, I was shaking, but then I was like, or like on the verge and I was like shaking during the scene and ready to walk out of the theater. Um, And the only reason I stayed was because I had heard so many good things about the movie and I'm like surely it must get better right or people wouldn't be saying all these great things about it um so I stayed but it's really like I noticed something I noticed this time is like we don't 
know how she got to be in that chair this time. Like we don't get to see the conversation where she consented to be hooked up to the lie detector. So like they're asking her all these questions and she's saying no, no, no. So like, does she know she like, does she know that they're going to ask those questions? Does she know what she really thinks? Does she know what the lie detector is going to say? Like, is this her way of like kind of giving consent without giving consent? And some setup to that would have helped us contextualize that better. If that's what the filmmaker was trying to show us. Um, Because like, I know, for example, like there's so much discourse around the baby it's cold outside song, right? Like that if you listen to it through like a modern lens, it sounds really non-consensual and rapey. But if you look at it through the, like the time that it was recorded, it's like, well, because women weren't really expected to have sexual agency, like, the way the song is set up, she actually is expressing her agency in the way that she was allowed to. So this scene could do that. It could be saying that, but we don't get the setup to show that it actually is saying that. So I remember like at the time that I saw this, it just straight up read to me as like gaslighting, right? Like she's saying no, the lie detector saying she doesn't mean it. So like, you know her like I said in the chat like her lips are saying no but her body is her what systolic blood pressure or heart rate or whatever is saying yes but also people lie for lots of reasons and some of those reasons are legitimate and one of the reasons you might lie is to say that you're not attracted to the people you work for when in fact you are um, because for whatever reason you are making a decision not to have sex with them or not to pursue a relationship with them, regardless of whether you want to. And that's totally valid as well. A lesser gripe that I also have with the first half of this movie is that in a movie being lauded by the polyamorous community for showing that it's possible to love multiple people at once, it never extends the possibility to, uh, shit, what's his name? Uh, Brad? Yeah, sure. For some unexplained reason, Olive isn't really in love with her fiancé, McDude Face, here. The movie makes that clear several times. They're engaged. Yes. Look, Olive is not a child. You can't control her. You can't stick a ring on her finger and put her in a box for your mantle, a good little woman behind her little man. Are you in love with Brent? Yes. That is a lie. And I don't really understand why this choice was made. Closed polyamorous configurations, also known as polyfidelity, is certainly something that some polyamorous people in some polyamorous configurations sometimes do. As I mentioned in my unicorn hunting video, it is a very common thing for couples looking for their third to demand exclusive access to her out of a fear usually that she will not prioritize them in the manner that they so want. And it kind of feels like to me anyway, that the movie also sort of adopts this idea that Olive couldn't have ever been really in love with her fiance because it would be too inconvenient for the plot or the romance we're supposed to be rooting for. Why not have there be a more legitimate reason for why she doesn't love him other than him just being a boring normie? Like, his only actual crime seems to be questioning their relationship, which actually seems pretty fair of him to do. Hey everybody, Editing Mandy here. So... Something I would like to take a point to acknowledge is that in the language of the film, Brent is definitely like portrayed as a not so great guy. Like he, you know, is very suspicious of Professor Marston and his wife. Uh, he kind of seems to imply that he knows that Elizabeth is deviant in some way and maybe trying to corrupt Olive. So I'm not saying that there is no reason within the film itself that Len doesn't like explain why maybe he's not the best choice. But the point is he doesn't even have to be in this movie. Like there was no reason to set up this weird kind of love quadrangle when ultimately she's not going to end up with him anyway. Like it's just such a lackluster like fart of an attempt <laughs> to justify it and I just don't understand why it was in this movie at all. I personally just don't think it adds anything to it. I don't find it very compelling and honestly sometimes he's not completely wrong to be concerned. I mean this is an older couple who are interested in his fiance. Again in the movie he does kind of say a couple of things that rub me slightly the wrong way. Like it's implied that 
Olive wasn't really that interested in him when he started pursuing her. But also, right before that story, we heard that Professor Marston also pursued a reluctant Elizabeth who turned him down several times. So when Professor Marston does it, it's romantic. It's showing how persistent he is. But when Brent does it, it's just weird and awkward and, oh, Brent, baby, sweet summer child, get out of here. Don't you know that you're kind of a... A fourth wheel today so that's kind of what I meant and I just wanted to elaborate on that because I don't know if that was very clear from what you know I was saying in this this part of the video so just just for some clarity there you go honestly I find it kind of fascinating how many people believe that polyamorous relationships have to be polyfidelitous and one in which everyone is dating everyone else it's actually probably one of the most common questions that polyams get does everyone have to date everyone else? Some configurations can certainly be like that, but that is much harder to maintain, especially the more people that are in the relationship. Again, watch the Unicorn Hunter video to learn more about that. So to me, this movie really feels like that it's not really made for polyamorous people generally, and it's more about adhering to certain stereotypes and misunderstandings on how polyamorous relationships work. If this movie is appealing to any particular part of the polyam community, it seems to be most likely the Unicorn Hunters which is, is bad, it's is bad, it's very bad. <laughs> the lack of outrage over Bill and Elizabeth's actions in the media is a silent indicator that even within the poly community, we have a poor understanding of what a healthy polyamorous relationship should look like. Because of all of this, the dubious consent, the uneven power dynamics, the explicit approval given to all of this by the movie, as well as the fact that at times it just kind of feels like unicorn hunter p I just have a really hard time being happy when all of these people finally decide to give their relationship a real go. The scene of their first group sexual experience, or I guess second if we're going to count the spinking scene, is supposed to be this big, sexy, triumphant moment, and yet, for me, it feels unearned. I don't feel like celebrating this. I wanted to like that scene. Like, if you just take out the scene from, like, when they kiss in front of the stage to like the end it's like pretty awesome and hot and like the first thing in the whole movie that actually feels that way and i wanted to like it because it was like like i but the whole lead up to it made it not enjoyable for me a hundred percent i feel the same way because like if, if that scene, without any context, if I just saw that scene, I'd be like, oh, yeah, this is kind of hot. This is kind of fun. It's very playful. It's very cute. I love the way that the, everyone's interacting with each other. It feels very comfortable, a little kinky in there, too. That's fun. But because of the rest of the movie <laughs> exists, <laughs> it just maybe in a different movie, a better one, I could actually be happy that we got to this point. But in this one, with these characters and the storyline that we've had thus far, I'm really just left feeling ick. We have a whole other half of this movie that we still need to talk about. But before we move on, maybe we should take a little pause right here to do an invitation to act out. Hey everyone. Sometimes when I have guests on this channel, whether we're doing a full proper collab or they're just watching a terrible movie with me, I like to give them the opportunity about what we cover in the activism corner. I just think it's like a really fun way to sort of like mix things up. And also it makes it a lot easier on me because because then I don't have to pick one. <laughs> so with that in mind, Eve Rickard had two really great suggestions for today's activism corner. I liked them both so much that I decided that instead of having to pick one or the other, that I was just going to shout out both of them. First of all, I'd like to bring your attention to the Unistoten camp. The Unistoten camp is an indigenous reoccupation of unceded Wet'suwet'en land in northern BC, Canada. Very much uh, in quotes the BC Canada part. The camp was set up specifically to stop companies like TransCanada from creating pipelines through their territories. The land has many resources that are important to the indigenous people who live there, including a spawning area that has helped sustain the local salmon population. A cabin was built 
specifically on the proposed location of a pipeline in 2010, and the project has been going strong ever since, now having grown to many more buildings, including a healing center. There are lots of ways to support the Wet'suwet'en people. I will include their website down below, as well as a link to their YouTube channel. You can donate financially or specific items. They do have a wish list on the Affirmation site. Start a fundraiser. They have guidelines on their website detailing how to go about this in the most respectful way possible. Or have your local organization create a state of solidarity. I personally am going to be donating $25 to the camp's legal fund and I invite anyone out there who can do so comfortably to see if you can match me. The second thing I'd like to shout out is the Victoria Community Fridge. If you're not familiar with the concept of a community fridge, it's basically what it sounds like. A fridge that is available to those in the community who need it. People can donate food to the fridge or those in need can take some home. It's kind of like a take a penny, leave a penny situation but with food. I will leave a link to their website down below in the description box as well so you can check out the guidelines for donations. If you live locally, you can drop off food or you can sign up for a cleanup shift. You can also share their information and start following them on Instagram to show them support. Since I don't live in the area, I will also be donating $25 to the fridge and I'll also follow them on Instagram so that I can share posts from them in the future. Thank you to Eve so much for bringing the Victoria Community Fridge and the Utenstoten Land Defenders to my attention. I'm hoping that those who are watching will accept this invitation to act out and help these people out today. And now, back to Professor Marston and his Wonder Woman. In the second part of the film, the triad moves to Ride, New York, passing off Olive as a widow who is staying with the Marstons with her two sons. Apparently, she had another son at some point. Elizabeth has also had a son, which is, wait, why did we skip so many? You know what? I don't have time for this. We get some scenes of domestic bliss with Olive being the stay-at-home mom, who sends off writing samples to publishers looking to get a bite, and Marston typing away at his typewriter. You too can be popular. This one's going to sell. I'm sure of it. They play with the children with an invisible plane. Oh my god, movie, chill out, we get it. And all sleep together at night. Elizabeth gets pregnant again, which we get to see this time, and tells Olive she's naming the baby after her. If it is, I shall name her Olive Ann. We then jump to 1940, following Marston into a lingerie store where the store clerk, aka the G-String King, which incidentally is the coolest name for a drag king I have ever heard, leans in and is like, Psst, hey bro, ever heard of kink? The photos and pornography that Marston gets from the G-String King seem to demonstrate his theories about dominance and submission S behaviors, the disc theory I mentioned at the start of this video. So he convinces his two ladies that they should do some more hands-on research. They go back to the G-String Kings for a rope demonstration, which is a lot less, hey, this is how you do this safely, and really a lot more philosophizing about the nature of pain and love, fantasy versus real life, etc. The truth is, men and women long to control, to be controlled. Human nature, real life is full of pain and disappointment. Fantasy, fantasy is possibility. Marson and Olive step up to take a turn at it, but Elizabeth interrupts, angry that Olive would go along with this. Marson and Elizabeth go into another room to have a fight. When are you going to stop justifying the whims of your cock with science? While Olive decides to try out some of the costume pieces that G has around. When Elizabeth storms back to get Olive, they are greeted by this sight. All right, and now we got a climactic shot for our trailer. Good job, everybody. That's a wrap. Elizabeth, in a rare moment where clear consent actually matters, asks Olive if this is what she wants, which she confirms, and then we get this slow, drawn-out scene of Elizabeth tying her up. Damn. Even I have to admit, this is, uh, this is pretty hot. Can you imagine how much hotter it would be? If the first half of the movie had been wildly different, just, just just imagine. I'm imagining it. Can Are you? In the next scene, we see Marston working on his initial concept for Wonder Woman, which he plans to inject with theories he's already established about disc and the innate nature of women versus men. Olive and Elizabeth mostly just find it rather silly and aren't convinced how successful it will be. We love you truly <laughs> so much. But nobody, and I say this with all the compassion and truth in my heart, nobody will ever publish this. 
In the next scene, Marston meets with Mr. Danes. Oh, hey, Oliver Platt. How are you doing? Nice to see you here. Danes isn't interested initially, but by the end of the meeting is on board, albeit with a suggestion to simplify the name. Why don't you just call her uh, Wonder Woman? Next, we get a little montage of the war, Wonder Woman comics being sold, and Marston being told to tone down the kink, which of course just causes him to triple it. There's like twice as much bondage stuff in here. Three times, and tripled it. By the way, shout out to whoever did the voiceover for this bit, because this guy f***ing nails it. With war raging across Europe, there's a new hero in town fighting for our freedom, and she's a lady. Towards the end of the montage, we see Elizabeth calling out of work, and then the triad having a bit of kinky fun of their own, which is then interrupted when a neighbor of theirs just walks into their house, which, rude. In the next scene, we see one of the Marson children coming home. Crap, which one is this? Don? Oh, right, Don. After having gotten bullied, prompting the parents to confront the neighbors, which culminates in some fisticuffs. Side note, but I love how if you take the dialogue out of the scene, it has kind of big, like, my polycule could beat up your polycule vibes. Elizabeth decides that they can't keep things going anymore because I guess she's got like internalized homophobia and polyamory phobia now or something. So Olive and her children leave the house. We get some clips of everyone living their lives over very sad music like Marston sitting at a table alone, clearly missing Olive, as well as some scenes of Olive dropping off the kids. Everyone who has ever been in a family with separated and or divorced parents recognizes this a little too well. Oh, and now we're caught up to the framing device. Yay. Marson impassionately puts this lady in her place, but then, oh no, Plotkoff is back. <laughs> Damn you, Plotkoff. As he's wheeled into the emergency room, we keep getting flashes of all of their threesomes and the kinky stuff they were into because, I don't know, I guess hospitals are kinky. Or maybe he thinks he's about to die and his life is like flashing like through his eyes or something. Who knows? I sure as hell don't. And also, I don't think I really care that much. We see Elizabeth call Olive and then Olive and Elizabeth join Marston's bedside. OK, I, I do like this shot. I will give you that movie. We cut to two months later and the married couple are waiting for Olive to show up. She does. And Marston tries to entreat Olive to come back to them. He also berates both women for giving up. You gave up the both of you. I'm going to die, and you will be left all alone with your bitterness and your rage and your knowledge that you loved her and she loved you and you threw it away for them. Oh, and he also claims that it's Elizabeth's fault if their kids felt any shame for who their parents are. Our Iced. children are inheriting your shame. Is that how you want them to live? Feminist icon. When that surprisingly doesn't work, he gets on his knees, making Elizabeth do the same, and then guiding her to confess her true feelings for Olive and asking her to come back. Please take us back. I thought I knew everything. I thought love wasn't enough. But it, it has to, it has to be enough because we cannot, we cannot live without you. I cannot live without you. And Olive agrees. I want you to love me for all of my days. All right. We then cut to Marston giving a press conference about Wonder Woman, which from the tone of the music, I think I'm supposed to see as uplifting. So, okay. To you, Wonder Woman is just a comic, but she's my life. She's my love. In the final shot of the film, we see Olive, Elizabeth, Marston, and their children in a park while the text tells us about Marston's death in 1947 from cancer, how Olive and Elizabeth lived together until Olive's death in 1985, as well as some information about the Wonder Woman comics and its legacy. The end. Well, for the movie, anyway, this video essay definitely isn't over yet. Before I saw Professor Marston and Wonder Woman, I did give Jill Lepore's book, The Secret Life of Wonder Woman, a read. It's been several years now at this point, uh, but from what I do remember, it is an interesting look at Marston and the two women in his life, as well as the many other influencing factors that would eventually inspire Wonder Woman. I do recommend giving it a read. I have also read some very quick snippets of Les Daniels' book, by the way. I honestly didn't know that he was the one who first popularized the theory that Marston was non 
monogamous until I actually started working on this video. I bring that up now because when I say that this movie is basically just one long historical fan fiction, I know what I'm talking about. I didn't bring this up in the part one discussion because it honestly felt more relevant to bring it up here because we see a lot of things that happen in the second half of the film that very likely didn't or definitely didn't happen. There is no documentation supporting Olive having ever left, even temporarily, nor is there any evidence that their neighbors ever became aware of their little polyamorous secret. I do believe that Marston faced some backlash for the scandalous nature of Wonder Woman, mostly in the terms of letters that he received from the Board of Decency, which he did get rather sanctimonious about. But the movie implying that like mass burnings were a thing doesn't seem to be accurate at all. There was a period of churches burning comics, including Wonder Woman after the publication of Seduction of the Innocent, but that was after Marston's death. As I mentioned at the top, biopics are very rarely that accurate. Often, usually only a small bit of the plot will actually resemble reality in any way. So this isn't really surprising. And in fairness, turning a real person's life into a narrative is always going to be challenging because real life is rarely so simple and easy to adapt into a three or five act structure. But I still did want to bring it up because the lack of historical accuracy does make me question a lot of the choices that were made. Like... The book is literally called The Secret Life of Wonder Woman because no one knew they were polyamorous. That's one of the reasons why it's so interesting. And yet, every five minutes, these people are being investigated by concerned neighbors or ex fiancés or are openly discussing their relationship in public spaces. Everybody knows all of. You haven't even bothered being discreet. Like, not to beat off a dead horse, but I do wonder why the center tension of the film wasn't these three just constantly trying to not get caught, which could have been really interesting and dramatic in its own way, instead of, I guess, just getting Elizabeth to relax? Like, it's honestly really wild to me how often the movie frames Elizabeth as a villain, or at least a character who needs to get over herself so that the film can have a happy conclusion. Her characterization just feels really inconsistent and seems to change for the convenience of whatever the plot requires. Elizabeth never really kind of owns her shit. <laughs> like, she never says yeah. she's sorry. She never, like, acknowledges how poorly she treated her. Like, from the beginning, it's just like, I need you, so you should come back. Um, and so I just, I feel like Elizabeth doesn't get a whole lot of a character arc in that she doesn't really learn or grow um, in the movie very much. I guess her arc is like, she eventually learns to say to Olive, I need you. But like, it's not, like you said, she doesn't apologize. She doesn't say like, I'm going to change the way I speak to you. I'm going to try and be more grateful or talk to you in a way that's not like constantly talking down to you she just is kind of like yeah that wasn't great not having you around so let's not do that anymore <laughs> it's it's really weird and then the, like I get it's kind of meant to be sort of sweet that Marston is sort of orchestrating this like apology in his like little hospital room but like because of his involvement, it comes off less genuine because he's constantly interrupting to tell Elizabeth how to properly apologize. And she was, by the way, the primary inspiration for Wonder Woman's personality, by the way. So like it just makes her characterization and the way she's written all the more confusing. The movie seems to want to simultaneously depict the prejudices of a cruel mononormative world using some pretty blatantly fascist imagery while also suggesting that all you really need to do to be happy is to just just accept who you are and love whoever you want, regardless of the consequences. Love is love. I feel like I'm at risk of sounding very cynical right now, but it's just a little frustrating to see Elizabeth, a queer woman, being blamed for the shame her children might feel for who she loves, seeming to just ignore how completely, absolutely dangerous it would have been for her to be out at that time. Marston having two women honestly wouldn't have been so appalling at the time. As I mentioned earlier, a professor having a relationship with a student really wouldn't have been frowned upon at the time. Or even today, most of the time. Gross. <laughs> 
nor would having a mistress necessarily be all that weird. Certainly living with them both under the same roof would have been a bit odd, but the point is he is not nearly at risk of losing everything the way that Elizabeth is. The scene where the neighbors are like, well, you know, what you do is your business, but stay away from your kids, is almost hilariously underwhelming, because in reality, there is no way that those neighbors would have been willing to be even that level of tolerant back in the day. Even now, a family like this would seriously risk the possibility of losing their children if they were open and honest about their relationship. So while historical accuracy is always going to go hand in hand with biopics, especially one of this nature, it honestly just feels so gross to me to so thoroughly, continually throw Elizabeth under the bus, especially when the director, a openly gay woman, should know better. <laughs> Perhaps the biggest liberty that the movie takes with the lives of Marston and the women in his life is arguably its biggest strength. We actually don't know for certain whether or not Elizabeth and Olive had a relationship. I, I mean, certainly they would have had some kind of relationship in the sense that two women living in the same household, sharing a relationship with a man and raising their kids together is going to have some kind of relationship, whether that be a strong friendship or even just a passing mutual respect. But as far as romantic goes, we honestly just don't know. Some people claim that there is evidence to support them being bisexual and in love with each other as well as Marston, such as Elizabeth's love of Sappho's poetry and cross-dressing. There's speculation that a research paper Marston wrote observing two women making love were very likely actually Olive and Elizabeth. And there's the fact that Marston himself was a very vocal supporter of lesbians, perhaps hinting that there were some not-so-straight ladies close to home. On the other hand, many surviving members of the Marston family have all come forward to say that the idea of Olive and Elizabeth being in love is ridiculous. For those assuming that a grandchild could not or would not know anything about their grandmother's sex life, I should explain that my knowledge of my grandmother is not as a child, but as an adult. Mine is not the viewpoint of a small child with a sweet old lady grandmother. We had a very close relationship. Graham's three or four week visits several times a year gave us plenty of time to discuss all the woes of mankind. Silly societal taboos on sex and sexual preferences was a topic we covered thoroughly. Graham was very open-minded and conversed clearly and freely. Graham was a firm believer that people should do whatever they damned well pleased the only stipulation being maturity and consent. Graham and Dots not only lacked that connectivity which couples have, but would have had no reason to hide. As to arguments that the relationship as imagined by Robinson's film could possibly be true, I do agree that nobody can ever say what somebody else lived. I can never swear that she and Olive never connected sexually, but I can say with 99.99% .99 certainty that they did not. It's sad, really. It would have been a nice boon for them if they had been lovers as well. But also, like, in theory, there's a chance they didn't even know that they were in a polyamorous relationship. So, like, take that with a grain of salt. We don't have any evidence that explicitly states that Olive and Elizabeth were together. It is just as likely that these three created some kind of unique relationship that sits firmly outside of a mononormative ideals and that after Marston's death, Elizabeth and Olive stayed together because they were just close friends. And also, being a single woman at that time, surviving on your own, was a lot more difficult. N not impossible, but certainly trickier. In an interview where Robinson was asked if making Olive and Elizabeth explicitly queer was based on research or just her interpretation, she responded, I mean, it's both. This is one of those things that's kind of tricky about history, especially history that has been obscured because of the relationships and because of society and many things. But there's certain facts that are indisputable about the Marston's lives, which everybody agrees on, and there are certain ones that are open to interpretation. You know what I mean? It's how you choose to interpret those facts. So that's how I chose to interpret them. I felt like I kind of went on my own journey, discovering, trying to do detective work, and what I came to was that the Marstons were these wonderful people with a lot of love in their life. I was especially struck by the fact that Elizabeth and Olive lived together for 38 years after Marston died. So to me, I wanted to tell a story about that love and what I thought was happening. 
Like, I'm really not trying to gal pals these two. I do really think that their love is the strongest part of the film. And I personally am kind of in the Elizabeth and Olive were together camp myself. But I'm also just trying to make it really clear that we don't know for certain. And anyone that's making that claim that they do is either lying or just really overconfident. I don't think it was a bad decision to have Olive and Elizabeth explicitly in love. And I can understand why the decision was made. There's certainly a lot of speculation about this, though not in Lepore's book. She takes the position that Marston and Olive had an affair first. And then he came to Elizabeth with basically an ultimatum saying, you know, take it or leave it. And Elizabeth decided that take it was the better option. Some people are not convinced that this is reality though so like you know just as a heads up. As the movie is doing its best to portray Marson as kind of a light as possible I get why the decision was made. Certainly it is far more sympathetic to see all the characters falling in love and struggling with that initially rather than you know having a lying cheating husband come to his wife and say that she has to be okay with his pregnant mistress moving in with them. But again, I'm just really curious why this movie remains so uncritical of Marston, even when he's just like espousing theories that we know today are completely bogus and or bioessentialist. Women are better at inducement than men. <laughs> the path to peace is not through finance or politics. It is to solve the problems of man's heart. Can't solve war by simply studying men's feelings. Of course you're right. Men's minds are far too limited. That's why we need women. If the nature of man is inherently violent and anarchistic, and the nature of women is inherently loving and nurturing, then shouldn't women be the ones to rule the world? What is extra baffling is that Robinson has claimed in interviews that she wanted Marston's more problematic traits to be evident. I do feel like I give his ideas a rigorous airing. I surround him with strong female characters who are constantly taking him to task and challenging him about how problematic a lot of what he which I feel myself as a person in how contradictory his ideas are. I tried to talk in the movie about his own misogyny and how it's embedded within his feminism. Like, I guess occasionally Elizabeth does kind of push back on Marston. Venus envy is figurative. It means a woman experiences an envy of the male position in the world. Uh -huh. His dominance, his ability to penetrate not just the woman, but life. Oh, penetrates life. Yes. Wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. But he's always framed in the movie as being ultimately right. The rope scene, for example, ends with Marston getting what he ultimately wanted. And for Elizabeth to trade yet again in a less than sympathetic light. Maybe this is a problem of there just being too many ideas being portrayed in this film. Like, so much is thrown at the audience that the film doesn't really have time to sort through any of these ideas with finer detail, depth, or nuance. Regardless of if you actually care about the historical accuracy, the second half-ish of the movie just feels a bit off. Not only does it feel oddly mismatched to the first half of the movie, particularly thematically, but it also just feels like the pacing just like really slows down, basically to a snail's pace. Like the rope scene is interesting and even I do find it kind of hot, but it's an eight and a half minute sequence that feels like it takes forever to get through. I also think that the framing device was just completely unnecessary and just completely grinds the film down to a halt every time they cut back to it. I feel like a better framing device, if we're going to keep this whole cutting back and forth bit, is to maybe have someone like Lepore or Daniel or even the Marston children going through Marston's papers to discover the story. This would help with the whole like, oh hey, this is a secret that the movie was just too lazy apparently to explore. But then also it might make the scenes with the review board and the backlash to Wonder Woman have more weight. In the movie, these scenes are almost inconsequential. Like they are a nuisance and act to temporarily distract the characters, but they don't feel like they have any real effect on the characters. It's almost more set dressing than plot. In my version of the story, the build up to the backlash would take on way more significance. Hell, maybe it could even fix the problem of Elizabeth's giving up seeming less way out of nowhere, you know, for insisting that plot point has to stay in. I also have an idea for a, just like a completely alternate version of a movie or just like a concept for the movie, which would basically be like little vignettes over like the period of time of, of Wonder Woman in different, in different settings and such, where you get to see all the different influences and stuff. Like you obviously have the Marstons, but then later in the 70s, you have like Gloria Stein and, and stuff like that. It would be kind of like um, if these walls could talk, but like Wonder Woman. So like, if these panels could talk. But I also recognize that that's a completely different movie and there's no way Warner Brothers would ever give me permission to make that. Cowards. So 
having seen this second half again, I do kind of see what people see in this movie. Like, there's a lot to like it in it from a polyam perspective. Um, if you like divorce it from the first half of the movie, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like, there's something. I mean, the whole scene of of um, them like facing discrimination and them sort of fighting for their relationship. There is something to that. And that final shot of the three of them walking in the park, like there is something really sweet about that. It's just, you have to really ignore the first half of the movie (laughs) for it to be as sweet and hits you in the feels as it does. Cause honestly, it does really feel like two separate movies. Cause like we're getting the emotional payoff we're getting at the end of this movie doesn't really have anything to do with the beginning of the movie. One last thing I would like to discuss before wrapping this up is the eroticism of the film, which of course spreads across both parts. We see characters having long lingering kisses, engaging in voyeurism and role play. The depiction of three people exploring more unconventional intimate desires was undoubtedly something that caught viewers' attention. Depictions of BDSM and kinky media is often not the best. Even when something semi-decent comes out, it usually is still steeped with a lot of problematic shit. Like, I love Secretary, but like, even I can admit that the beginning of that film and the way that relationship starts off is pretty sketchy, especially with the implication in the film that this is not the first time he has done this with an underling of his before. At the moment, the only film that I can really think of that depicts BDSM in a way that I actually think was pretty healthy and really good is the film Love and Leashes, which is a South Korean film that was on Netflix. At least I think it's still on Netflix. Hopefully it is. It's, it's really good. And I definitely think you should all watch it. Evie Lupine and I believe also Cat Black have made videos talking about that movie. So I would highly recommend go checking out their analysis on it. Robinson spoke pretty extensively about the importance of the eroticism of the film. A lot of times sex in stories isn't essential to the story. But here you literally can't understand the people if you don't understand this part of them. That was essential here. And overall, the scenes revolved around this disc theory, around dominance and submission and so forth. So I was obsessed with exploring not only the male slash female desire, but the dimensions of female desire and how complicated that can get. I was obsessed with the notion of consent, and I thought that's what was sexy about it, about the emotional limbs they were going out on. I have some pretty mixed feelings about how Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman approaches the intimate scenes, to be honest. The spanking scene, for example, crosses several lines, as I've already explained. The rope demonstration is a bit more promising, like definitely not perfect or as good as it could have been, but it was refreshing to have a scene in which Olive clearly consents to something in an environment where everybody has chosen to be there and be involved. The scene right before the neighbor walks in on the three of them is probably the best one, in my opinion. Like, there was something really nice about seeing everyone being so, you know, playful and just having a good time, as opposed to the more traditional depictions of BDSM which is all you know like serious faces and degradation by the way I'm not like trying to yuck anyone's yum here um I'm just pointing out that a lot of times in the media when you do see BDSM being represented it's always very like serious and I don't know that's just not the way that I and my people do but you know whatever works for you (laughs) With that said, I do want to remind people that sex in polyamory can be just as varied and different as sex in monogamy. Hell, some polyamorous people don't even like having sex. Threesomes or other group sizes are not always the norm. I wish we had gotten to see more moments of Elizabeth and Olive having one-on-one time or Olive and Marston or whatever, as opposed to only ever having the group in these sexual intimate scenes. Maybe a bit of a minor gripe, but like as a solo polyamorous slash relationship anarchist who is kinky but also very tired and busy. I would just like to see less emphasis on group sex in polyus representation in the media. Like look threesomes can be fun but like sometimes you know I'm busy I got a lot to do and it's just like way too much stimulus for me to handle. I am but one humble human. I hope it's not jarring to see me sit down now, but my feet hurt. So we're doing the conclusion on a stool. I don't want to end this review on like a negative note. So let me just mention a few things that I did like about the movie. For starters, the chemistry between Bella and Rebecca is just truly off the charts. Like as much as I find the first half of this movie really problematic and hard to watch, like I can't deny that these two just vibe off of each other so good. 
I have known queer couples who look at each other like this, and it was just really lovely to see that represented on screen. The rope scene in particular is beautifully acted, even though it feels like it takes 30 years. I also really enjoyed seeing a rope demonstration on screen, even if the focus of the scene was less about here's how you do this safely and more about like philosophizing about like love and life or whatever, but you know, that's fine. Something I liked and honestly, maybe kind of a bad way, but like I'm still going to bring up in this section um, is kind of the more over the top Wonder Woman references like this and this, and especially this one. What's the opposite of an Easter egg? I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. And, um, I liked the costumes. There were some really cool costume pieces. Regardless of how I personally feel, I do want to acknowledge that myself and Eve, you know, we just represent two people in a much larger polyamorous community. And a lot of people do really love this movie. I think we deserve far, far better representation than what we were given here. But I also understand the desire to just, you know, grab onto this and hold it on as tightly as possible. Polyamory is gaining more visibility, but we are still fighting for legal protections, having to do a lot of work to battle disinformation and constantly having to defend our actions to people who don't want to give us an inch to begin with. It makes sense to me why some people have their rose tinted glasses on when they watch this movie. But I do hope that we can have honest conversations about its flaws and that we can also show up to support media that depicts polyamory in far, far less problematic ways. I recommend this movie for its artistry, its moving depiction of an organic relationship, and its groundbreaking depiction of polyamory. However, the praise that's been heaped on it by mainstream and poly audiences actually makes me feel less understood as a poly person. And like this wasn't in my script, but I do want to say like I understand that there's always going to need to be some kind of conflict in a narrative like this. Like if everyone does everything right all the time, that's boring, right? Like I, I understand that 100%. But I do think there are ways to talk about and depict polyamorous relationships that are flawed and interesting, but not like abusive. <laughs> Granted, the way Hollywood is right now, daring cinema tackling far more exciting new subjects just doesn't really seem to be the priority right now, but I can dream. Also, Warner Brothers, seriously, let me make my Professor Marston film, okay? It's going to be really good. I can get your proposal in no time, and I also have some suggestions of people that you can use for casting. Picture this. Abigail Thorne as Elizabeth. In a second act, she's going to read all of a sapphic poem. Also, I'm going to put the word poor throughout the script just to make her say it, because it's adorable. <laughs> I finally fished, finished it. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> you know what? Fuck it. We're keeping that take. We're just going to keep it. Hey, everybody. Uh, so obviously, this is not my usual setup. Uh, I'm just like holding my fucking mic right now. So if the audio on this is bad, too. Sorry. So this video was supposed to come out in August. It is it is not August. I don't know if you all noticed that. Uh, the last couple months have been a lot. Like between the move and all of that and getting settled into this apartment and then finding out there were problems with the apartment that they didn't tell us about. Um, and some of the renovation stuff wasn't done and just and and that's there's just that and then there was there there's just been so much y'all you know there was the move itself which a move is always very draining and I don't know why I thought I could get something out sooner even with the move I guess I just kind of figured like oh I've moved so many times I got this but moving when you know you're 35 after having lived in one place for six years is a lot different than in your like early to mid 20s when you're moving like every year it's a little bit different on top of that, there was just like a lot of stuff that happened behind the scenes in terms of like uh, separate people coming to me with abuse allegations. Um, there was a whole thing you may have heard recently on the news where there was a shooting in a nearby main town, which was absolutely horrific. Luckily, everyone that I know is safe, but I am connected to this and very like the way that Maine is, it's kind of a seven degrees of Kevin Bacon kind of thing, except usually it's really only like two or three in most cases. And honestly, it really hit me hard as it did a lot of people, as as I'm sure 
you're all aware. There's more stuff, but I don't want to bore you with all the details. The point is, I have been trying very hard to get this video to you, and I'm very sorry it took this long. I'm also sorry that the audio quality in some parts is not very good. I'm still learning how to use this mic properly. I have actually lately have been putting a sock on it to help with like the sound that you heard quite a bit uh, and I've been doing better about you know distance wise and like where to keep the mic so for anyone who's like writing and furiously in the comment section right now giving me audio advice you really don't have to I'm doing better now it's just at the time we were trying something new and I've been still just trying to figure out the best way to, to do things I'm now in my new apartment because of how things have been I still haven't really gotten all the new equipment and set up things exactly the way I want to film here but we are working on it. We are going to get this to you soon. I promise my closet is finally in a position where pretty soon we can actually set things up or, or rather we were ready to, to set things up in my closet and then black mold appeared. So that's fun. That's the thing we have to deal with now. Honestly, y'all, there was a point in the last couple months where I almost quit YouTube completely because the last couple months, it really just started to feel like the universe was just telling me, hey, maybe this isn't for you, but we're doing okay. The cats are okay everything's fine. It's just, it's just been a lot lately. So, uh, some, some announcements here, like, you know, uh, I've started seeing my therapist again, which is great. I also, uh, have taken quite a hit on Patreon, honestly. And, and I understand why, you know, along with just the fact that everything's so expensive right now, I imagine that some people were like, oh, well she hasn't come out with a video. So I need to put my money elsewhere and, and, and like really no judgment. However, if you did enjoy this video and are feeling generous and have some money to burn, I would definitely appreciate you all going over to patreon.com slash mainlymandy to give me some money. That would definitely help with like paying my therapist and, you know, getting my hair done, which I haven't been able to do in like three months. I also uh, have cats who are now senior cats and uh, Tantrum has lumps on him right now and it looks like they're okay, but like terrifying at the same time and we have to keep an eye on that so you know just maybe give me some money in case we eventually do have to surgically remove his lumps also i don't know if you can see him right now but he got a lion cut recently and he's just so cute yeah you isn't he adorable i love you so much so yeah i i really felt like i needed to like redo this outro um and give you something new because I just it just didn't feel right to just use the intro or the outro from from before um so anyway I really appreciate everyone's patience I would like to tell you that there's going to be at least one more video out before the end of the year I don't know if that's going to happen to be honest with you I would rather just be honest and say I don't know rather than say yeah totally it's totally going to come out because we know what happens when I say stuff like that. And I'm really excited to get to move on to some new projects and actually also be able to invest in my space and in my equipment and getting some new things set up. So please stick around. New stuff is going to be coming eventually. It's just been really tricky and difficult over here. And I really appreciate everyone who's like sticking through this and just this this is this is what you get this is what you get this is the best i can do right now okay i'm sorry i had no energy to put on makeup this was just what you're gonna get <laughs> thank you all so much for being here thank you so much to eve rickert for appearing in this video um i really appreciated that she was willing to talk to me about this movie and i also appreciate her patience and waiting for this video to come out <laughs> So thank you all so much for watching. If you haven't yet, subscribe down below, especially if you're a suffering sappho. <laughs>
Nope. <laughs>